Well, as uh, everybody who, who has stepped up here this morning uh, has wished you a good morning, I will do the same. Good morning. Good morning. See, this is week three for me, right? Week three. The last two weeks prior to this, I've had to say good morning a couple of times before we got the response that we just got this morning. So, uh, right on. Things are working. We're getting excited. And, uh, uh, and here we are with... Uh, Another Sunday morning and another name of God. Um, we've, uh, we've covered Jehovah Jireh last week, the Lord who provides. And um, man, that was kind of a fun sermon. Uh, I told you last week that it was one that uh, I'd been wanting to preach on for uh, some time, the scripture. And I got that opportunity and it was quite a blessing to be able to do that. Uh, this morning we're going to talk about Jehovah Nisi, uh, the Lord our banner. This is also a pretty good one. Uh, there, we're going to cover a lot of scripture, and uh, so be prepared for that. I hope everybody has their Bible out. Before we get started, let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time that we've already had, Lord, to come together and just worship you. Uh, we thank you for the music uh, uh, that has uh, inspired us, uh, that, is, that has allowed us to kind of get to a deeper level uh, in worship today. Uh, we thank you for the uh, taught word already, Father. We thank you for what's fixing to come. Uh, we just pray, Lord, that you would uh, be with all of us. Uh, be with me, Lord, as I speak uh, your truth. Uh, just pray that the ears, uh, heart, and mind are open uh, to those that are here and that th for those who are listening uh, on the radio or, or online. Uh, Father, just pray that you'd be with all of us. Touch us in a mighty way. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, well, let's go ahead and open up to Exodus chapter 17. Israelites, man, the Israelites, uh, they really went through a lot, didn't they? They were, they were doing good at times, and at times they weren't doing so good. And it was kind of this up and down uh, thing that they had going. And, and, and the closer we look at their travels and the things that they went through, the, the more we see our life kind of... Uh, 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 mirroring that walk in the desert. In chapter 17, the first few verses here, the first seven verses, uh, we're going to read this real quick and kind of set a stage uh, for where the Israelites are at this point. So, it, Exodus 17, verse 1. Then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin according to the commandment of the Lord and camped in Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted, uh, and the people thirsted there for water and the people complained against Moses and said why is it you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst so Moses cried out to the Lord saying what shall I do with these with this people they are almost ready to stone me and the Lord said said to Moses go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel also take in your hand your rod which you uh with which you struck the river and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So he called the name of the place Mesa and Meribah, because, he, because of the contention of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? So, here we are in a situation, the, the Israelites were complaining, they, they did this frequently, and so they were complaining about this, this they were thirsty, and they were, they were really struggling with this, and they had their wish answered, they got the water that they needed. Uh, you know, and then in verse, uh, well, as we, as we go into the text that we're going to study, in verse 8, we see that once we get through with <laughs> one issue, with one problem, we kind of just step right off into another problem. It's, it's this constant thing. So we're just going to get right into it. In verse, uh, see, 
chapter 17, verse 8 says, Now Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Man, they just got water to drink. They just got comfortable. And then here we are uh, with the Amalekites in Rephidim. From one problem right into another. Now, Amalek, this family, uh, or this group of people came from the family of Esau. And it's kind of funny that some of the trials and problems in our life seem to come from within our own families. A lot of them do. It, it's just, you know, everybody has family members that they don't get along with, or church family members we don't get along with. Everybody's like, no. We get along with everybody. Now, yeah, probably not. Probably not. That's all right. But it's just funny how, how God just makes it the people closest to us are the ones that we have most problems with. As we go into verse 9 through 11, it says, And Moses said to Joshua, Choose us some men and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. Well, Moses is, uh, he's, he's got the rod of God. Now this rod of God has done a lot of things. As we started off in the first seven verses of chapter 17, it struck the rock and it produced water for Israel. Uh, it is the, the same rod that, uh, that split the Red Sea. It's the same rod that uh, brought up, uh, uh, plagues upon uh, the Egyptians. Uh, this is a pretty amazing thing. The rod of God. God uses this stick, this natural thing, to do supernatural events. He uses a natural thing to do supernatural events. Well, Joshua, they send Joshua down to the valley to fight. And Moses goes up on the hill. Now, as Joshua's down there fighting, you know, Moses is up on the hill. And when he raises up this stick, the Israelites prevail. When he lowers the stick, the Amalekites prevail. There's this battle going on, and he'll raise it up, and Israel's prevailing, and Israel's winning, and he lowers it, and the Amalekites are winning. And it's back and forth, back and forth. The war on the ground was not decided by those who were fighting on the ground. We can very easily overlook this fact. Joshua's down there, you know, he's, he's fighting the, the Amalekites, and... Uh, he, all he sees is that at one point we're winning, and at another point we're not. At this moment, we're beating the snot out of the Amalekites. <laughs> well, now they're beating us again. Man, what is going on? He doesn't realize that Moses is up on the mountain raising that staff, and every time that staff raises, they're winning. Every time it lowers, he's, he's, they're losing. So this war is decided on what Moses is doing at the top of the mountain, not what's happening down in the valley. There's really, uh, you know, the fight down in the valley, it, it, it's this fight, you know, that Joshua is doing, it, it's, it, he can't see what's going on on the mountain. He's too focused on, on the Amalekites and the issue at hand, the things that are right in front of him. He can't see what Moses is doing. And, you know, this fight down in the valley doesn't really uh, have anything to do with Joshua's capability of fighting. It, it doesn't have anything to do with the, the amount of people that he has. Um, it doesn't have anything to do with the, the, the strength or weakness of either side. But it has everything to do with what Moses is doing on top of the mountain. If, you know, if, if we look at ourselves... In our battles, it doesn't matter if, whether we're winning or losing. And it, we, we have a, lot of, a lot of times we have 
this thought that, you know what, if, it's, if, if I've got the money, I can overcome this battle. If I've got the right friends, I can overcome a battle or a situation. You know, if I've got the connections, if, if I've got these things on my side, I can overcome and beat my Amalekite. There's really about, there's two extremes that we see in this scenario. The first extreme is Joshua. If we put ourselves in Joshua's place, the first extreme for us is, man, we can handle this all on our own. You know, we, we get going, and it is all about what I've got, what I've learned, my experiences, my experiences in life. You know, it's all of these things. It's, it's the friends that I have that are going to help me get through this situation. You know, there's, we, we've all been there a time or two, surely, that, you know, we get in there and we say, say okay, we can handle this, man, we've got this. And then there's, there's another extreme to this is that, you know, uh, uh, some of us, and, I, and I've certainly been there, and I've said, you know what, I'm going to let God handle the whole thing. I'm just going to sit back and watch God work. Well, now over here on this side, we've got just the kick back, laid back, not worried about a thing. God's got it. And over here, we've got, no, nope, I've got this. God's already taught me what I need to know. I've got it. We have two extremes. You know, these extremes, man, when we start battling things in our life, when we start battling for our children, we know when we start battling for careers, when we start battling for for anything in life, you know, man, when we start here's when we start battling illnesses in our life, you know, it, it, a, a person can have cancer and can be dying of cancer, and over here on this extreme, they're like, man, I'm gonna I'm gonna take all the right medication, I'm gonna go to all of my appointments, all of these things are gonna fix me. And over here, this person with cancer is going, I'm not going to do a thing. God's got it. Man, those are pretty major extremes. Well, you've got to be willing to have a little bit of both. You've got to be on the mountain without, to, to be on the mountain without being willing to fight, you know, uh, is not a, not a good place to be. We have responsibilities to take care of some of this, and we have to be sure that we release some of the situations to God to allow Him to help us with these things. To think that your uh, capacity alone is sufficient to handle a situation in life is ridiculous. Yes, we have situations, we have things that we are supposed to do in life, we have, we have these things that Joshua's doing. We need to be in the battle. We need to be fighting ourselves. But at the same time, we need to know that we've got to be reaching up to heaven and asking for supernatural ability to come and, and, and inject itself into our situation. It's only understanding that you have to bring the mountain and the valley together to experience total victory. We don't get total victory on this side, doing it all ourselves, and we can't have total victory over here let, just allowing God to take it all. What we have is total victory when we bring the mountain and the valley together. When we fight for what we're working on while reaching up to heaven for answers there as well. We've got to bring the mountain and the valley together. We have a responsibility to do all that we can do. We have a responsibility to do all that we should do, and we have a responsibility to do all that we're supposed to do. If you spend all your time, you know, you can spend all your time in prayer. You can spend all your time in church. Never executing your responsibility, then God has nothing to work with in the valley where the Amalekites are. If we spend all of our time executing our, resp our own responsibility, we... we we can't get the injection from God that we need to, to start fighting and uh, help us out with these issues, these Amalekites in our, in our life. So on one hand, God is going to fix it, and on the other hand, we must fix it. It's a two-way street. 
God's in control of it. <laughs> and we have a responsibility to do. We've got to meet these things in the middle. You cannot shift to God what belongs to you. And uh, both must always be held in play. You can't, you can't take your responsibility and, and pass it over to God. And God certainly can't take His part and pass it to you. He's got to take the natural, you, and give supernatural ability. Right? And in order to give, it super, give you supernatural ability, you have to be used. You can't just sit there. It's almost as if we become the staff in a way. Isn't it? God uses the natural to do the supernatural. He uses us when we're willing to be used. When we're willing to step in the ring and fight. When, we're, when we are willing to handle our part of it, our responsibility... He's going to give us the supernatural ability to handle it. God's going to work through us. So am I fulfilling my responsibility? Am I making contact with heaven? If you're not making contact with heaven, all your fighting is, a wasted, is just wasted energy. If you're not making contact with heaven, all of your fighting is just wasted energy. And if you're sitting over here doing nothing but contacting heaven, I'm not even real sure how to explain that. Not getting very far. But if you're contacting heaven, all you're finding is a waste, wasted energy. And if you're doing all uh, contacting, then you're not being a vessel for, for God to use you. You're not being a vessel for God to use you. This Amalek, you know, is anything that stands in your way. Uh, Amalek shows up many times in the Old Testament. We can see Amalek just causing problems all over the place. You know, I said Amalek was, uh, uh, comes from the family of Esau. You know, it comes from God's family. And it, it, it is this, this evil thing. If we can look at it now if, uh, if portrayed as evil in our life. And Roy said something earlier, and I'm, I might be jumping ahead of my own notes, that uh, we kind of have to let go of it completely. We kind of have to let go of that stuff completely. And if these uh, Amalekites, so this uh, uh, Amaleks in our life, if they just keep coming back, we, we're, we, it's like we're fighting the same group of people all the time. We're fighting the same group all the time. Well, on into the next verse, verse 12, we'll look at the very first part of this verse. Um, and it says, says what here? Moses' hands become heavy. Moses is getting tired. You know, as Moses is lifting up this staff, the Israelites are winning, but his hands keep coming down. His hands keep coming down. Well, why? Man, that thing gets heavy after a while. Has anybody tried to hold a can of beans over their head for a long period of time? Okay, maybe that wasn't a good example. <laughs> tried that yesterday. Everyone's like, yeah, dude, I got that. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Well, I guarantee you that all of us have fought things in our life. We've all fought Amalekites in our life for long periods of time, haven't we? We all have something in our life that we have fought, and we have fought, and we have fought. And, man, we just get tired. When I think of Moses, you know, holding this staff over his head... Green beans is kind of a joke because one of the one of the things I have the hardest time doing at the gym when I'm working out, they're like, oh, here he goes again, is overhead carries. I hate them with a passion. Why? <laughs> because I'm not good at them. They're heavy. I can't hold my arms up that high. You know, 
Aaron, he makes us hold the, that 45-pound weight over our head and marches us all around town like, you know, all of us should be able to do it. I can't, I can't get it very long, man. I, it comes down. I, before I know it, I'm, I'm walking this 400 like this, and, and then you can hear him, get that weight up, and, you know. And Man, it's tough. Your arms get tired. Well, imagine Moses. He's on top of that mountain. He's got the staff of God. And if you just lift your hands up long enough, they're going to get tired. They're going to get tired good darn thing that he had somebody there to help, isn't it? On to the rest of the verses. Let's see here. The rest of 12 says, But Moses' hands became heavy, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it, and Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. He had help. He had help. He's holding that staff up. It's getting tired. His hands are getting weak. And he knows that if that, if that staff drops, that the Israelites are going to lose. And, 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 but he's trying with all of his might to hold that staff up. And he can't do it on his own. He just can't do it on his own. How many of us have been in a situation, man, where you're struggling with, where you're struggling with an Amalekite in your life, and, you, man, you just can't fight it on your own. You can't fight it on your own. You need somebody there to help you out. You need, you need brothers and sisters to there to help hold you up. Help hold that staff. You cannot do it on your own. Well, he definitely had brothers to help him. The dependence on God had to be held up. This is why God wants every Christian to be a part of a local church. There are things in life that you cannot handle on your own. You cannot. This is my favorite part because I know this goes out on the radio, and I know that there's people listening at home right now that might even be right down the street, and they're like, you know what? I'm a Christian. I listen to the sermons online. I'm good. I don't need to go to the church. Yes, you do. You need to be a part of a local church. And you need, to, you need to be more than just sitting in the pew. Once you start doing more than that, you become friends. You, you have fellow uh, you know, brothers and sisters who are going to know you on a, on a more personal level. Because it's hard to hold somebody up if you don't know what they're struggling with. You know, it's easy to go into church and, 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 and sit, sit in the pew or stay at home and you, you know that you're struggling with things, but you know what? Why aren't people helping you? Because people don't know. They don't know. People cannot inject themselves into your life until you inject yourself into theirs. It's a two-way street. It's a two-way street. Man, I struggled with this for a long time. Long time. Man, I wish I could get some help out of the church, man. I'm struggling. I'm fighting. These issues, man, they're, they're eating me up. I, I love Jesus Christ. You know, He's been in my life for years. But I don't understand why it hurts so bad. Why isn't anybody helping me? Well, here's some reasons we fall. For those of you still in the church here. We lose spot, uh, uh, sight of our spiritual necessity. And we can be Christians and totally lose sight of the necessity of prayer, the necessity of God's Word, and the necessity of fellowship. We have to have those things. We can lose sight of them. It's very easy to come to church, worship, and go home, and that's it. We don't have an Aaron or a her if we're doing that. We don't have somebody right there beside us setting us down on a stone and lifting our arms to heaven. We're not willing to have our hands lifted up. 
Now, here's another issue I struggled with for many, many years. <laughs> Prideful. I can do this on my own. We're not willing to let anybody else help. You know, <laughs> we're too dependent on ourselves. You know, he, here's the thing is, <laughs> whew, man, if you, you, you all out there that have a wife and kids, dads, I'm going to pick on you. If you've got wife and kids and you don't allow your wife and kids to help support you, you're in the wrong place. You are in the wrong place. I can remember being down and struggling with God so bad. <clears throat> I'm thinking to myself, man, who is, who's helping me? Who's helping me? Knowing in my mind that I can't do it on my own, but I, I, I don't know who else is helping me, and yet here's my family right here beside me, and I can't, even help, I can't ask them for help. Funny thing is that God knows they're there. Uh, <clears throat> I remember... Being, I was struggling. Man, I was sitting on the couch, and I tell this story every so often. I try not to tell it too much because my, my little one likes to try to make me cry. My little one. <sighs> she was in the bathtub that night. Golly, how old was she? Five? Six? And I was tired. Man, my arms were heavy. And she's singing praises to God from the bathroom. She didn't have a clue what she was doing other than worshiping the Lord in her own way. God says, you know what? You need somebody to help hold your hands up. And he gave me her. And then there's my wife. Oh, man, I must be tired a lot <laughs> there she is, holding my arms up, reminding me to look to heaven, reminding me of my necessity from God Almighty. Oh, I wish I would have gotten more than three hours sleep last night. <sighs> yeah, man. Anyway, we go through all of these things, all of these different battles. You know, the, the, the battle, the, the, the Amalek in your life, it, it's, it's so many things. It, 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 could be, it could be a person in your life. It could be the places. It could be things. It could be ideas. All of these different things we struggle with. These things, the problem with these things is that the, the issue part of it, sometimes we don't realize what's driving the issue of, of these of these. Amalekites, these issues. Man, evil could be driving these things. And if we're not in tune, heavenly, we overlook that. So if we don't confront the evil that drives the situation, then we're not attacking the source of that issue. You know, if we're standing over here, and we're trying to take care of everything naturally, we're not attacking the source of the issue. We have to have the spiritual connection. We have to have our arms raised to heaven over here so that we can attack the evil of the situation that we're working on over here. You've got to meet them in the middle. On the ground, you're dealing with Amalek. On the mountain, you're dealing with the evil of Amalek. You got to hit it from both sides. But the guys on the ground are fighting, they're, they're winning one minute and losing the next, and they have no idea why. They have no idea why. They're over here naturally trying to defeat this army in front of them, and they don't understand why they're, they're winning one minute and not winning the next. Man, we're so good at that. Maybe, uh, the reason your Amalek is not going away is because you think it's what you're doing that will determine the outcome. You think it's what you're doing that's going to determine the outcome. You know, though what you're doing is important. Again, we have got to be physically involved with our situations as well as spiritually involved. 
Well, if there's evil tied to a problem, then there is nothing you can do to prevail on your own if you're over here. If there is evil tied to your situation, there's not a thing you can do if you're over here on this side not doing anything na uh, uh, spiritually. Your natural self cannot get rid of the evil that's in these situations. Verses 13 and 14 Say, so Joshua defeated Amalek and the people with the edge of the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. What battles are you fighting? What battles are you fighting? When you're fighting these, what, what two things are you doing? You're, the, these are the two things you need to be doing. Give everything that you've got in the valley. You've got to fight. You've got to fight in the valley. And then you need to hold up the banner on the mount. You need to hold up the banner on the mount. And you do whatever it takes to keep those arms raised to heaven. Now there's definitely no guarantee that you won't have an Amalek in your life, right? There's no guarantee. I can't, I can't stand up here and say, you know what, if you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, the rest of your life is going to be a breeze. You know what? Accepting Christ into your life is going to bring you some more issues. It's going to bring you a few more. Some of us keep finding Amalek, and Amalek keeps coming back. Roy, we don't hand our problem off. It just keeps coming back. If we don't defeat it and then know that it's defeated, here it comes again. We don't necessarily like the idea. Also, I want to get into this. Some of our problems, some of the sin in our life, that keeps returning to us. We know it's sin. We know that we need to get rid of it, right? We're fighting it naturally. We've even, we've even reached up to heaven. We've got some answers from God, and we've asked God to help us, and He's come down, and he's, He has pulled us out of situations in our life that we know that we're not supposed to be in. Whether, whether it's an extramarital marital affair, whether it's pornography, these are things that have evil behind them, okay? And... And we've fought those naturally. We've reached up to heaven and we've allowed God to do His part. And, and we've, we've He's given us these supernatural, uh, this supernatural ability to be just pulled right out of these situations. But sometimes we keep going back to them. Sometimes we keep going back to them. Why? Because there are some sin in our lives that we like. We are naturally sinful. And there are things about our sinful life that we enjoy. We would be liars if we said anything else. But we know that they're wrong. So we don't really, when God pulls us out of those situations, we really don't let go of them, do we? We don't, don't always let go. God says that he will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek. Utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. That sounds pretty complete to me. Why does it keep coming back for us? Why does it keep coming back? Well, I'm going to turn to First uh, First Samuel, and if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn there with me because we're going to read a pretty good little bit of scripture. And uh, you know, I was talking about the Amalekites and how uh, they keep showing up in the Old Testament over and over and over again. And and God there in in, in Exodus said that He'd blot them out. But there's something here that Saul does that is a perfect example of what we do. 1 Samuel chapter 15, 
give everybody just a moment to get there. And we're going to start in verse 1. We're going to read uh, uh, 23 verses of chapter 15. I don't have it up on the screen, so hopefully if you're listening or, or watching, uh, you've got your Bibles open as well. 1 Samuel 15, verse 1. Samuel also said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint the king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore, heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he uh, ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek, and utterly destroy all that they have, and do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child ox and sheep, camel and donkey. So Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in uh, Telaim, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men of uh, Judah. And Saul came to a city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. Then Saul said to the uh, Kenites, Go, depart, get down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with, the, with them. For you showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites, and Saul attacked the Amalekites uh, from Hevala all the way to Shur, which is east of Egypt. He also took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly, utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag, Agog, and uh, the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and, and that which was good, and were unwilling to utterly destroy them, but everything despised and worthless, they utterly destroyed. Now, the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, for he has turned back from following me, and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried out to the Lord all night. So when Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul went to Carmel, and indeed he set up a monument for himself, and he has gone on around, passed by, and gone down to Gilgal. Then, <clears throat> excuse me. Then Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandments of the Lord. But Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears, and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have utter, utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said to Saul, Be quiet, and I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said to him, Speak on. So Sam, Samuel said, When you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king of Israel? Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the uh, sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down uh, on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, But I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me and brought back Agag, king of Amalek. I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took, uh, took of the plunder sheep and oxen and best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. So Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to heed then, then and to heed then to fat, I'm sorry, and to heed then the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is an iniquity and idolatry because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He also has rejected you from being king. Hmm. The Lord told Samuel to tell Saul to kill all the Amalekites. Why do these Amalekites keep coming back? Well, it's a perfect example. This is what we do. Saul went and destroyed everything. But he kept a little. Why? Okay, he wanted to sacrifice some of the animals to the Lord, but why King Agag? Why did he keep him? Now think about this for just a moment. When we fight these issues and, and the Lord pulls the Amalekite, 
out of our life. And we hold on to just a little bit. Maybe one of the reasons is because we become boastful in what we did. God helped. Matter of fact, God took care of most of the evil. I'm not going to say all of it because you held on to a little. But in our own power over here, we were proud of ourselves for taking care of the situation in our life. I'm going to bet King Saul, he was probably marching King Agag around going, look what we did. All right? Look at what we did. We, we wiped out the Amalekites. We took care of all of them. He almost blinded himself, thinking that he utterly destroyed. I don't think he understood exactly what the Lord meant when he, say, when he said utterly destroy everything. Many times in the Old Testament, we see the Lord saying, go and fight against these people and destroy them all. Man, women, children, and all livestock. Burn their cities to the ground, the Lord says. And in most cases, what do we find? Not all of it's done. We hold on to a little bit. Hey, that house is nice. I don't think I'll burn that one. I think I'll live in it for a little while. But the Lord said to burn it all. It's funny, the Lord says, you know, we come in here on a Sunday morning to worship the Lord, and we worship Him by, by song, we worship Him by, by way of sermon, uh, we worship Him by way of fellowship, and we, we worship, 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 worship. But God really tells us that before we come worship, we need to be obedient. We need to be obedient before we worship. We need to do what God's asking us to do before we worship. It, obedience, let me say it this way, obedience is more important than worship. It says so right here in God's Word. Obedience is more important than worship. Well, it's kind of funny how Saul dies. He's uh, in a war with a certain group of people. Want to guess who they were? The Amalekites. He died by the very thing that he was this close to utterly destroying. How many of us as Christians go through life not totally killing the Amalekite in our life and it ends up taking us? How many Christians do you know or pastors of a church? <laughs> How many pastors of churches have gone on to say, I'm done with that? Man, that's sad. They've let the Amalekite in their life take them. Well, God's not trying to be mean. He just knows uh, that if that stuff stays in your life, it's not going to be any good. We have to have Amalek removed completely uh, to, <laughs> to enjoy complete victory. Many of us have experienced victory. We've experienced victory in salvation. Um, we've in, experienced victory in issues and problems in our life. But how many of us have experienced complete victory? If there's a problem in your life that you've been struggling with and you've experienced some victory over it, yet it still comes back and haunts you, you have not experienced complete victory. I'll stand up here and tell you there are things in my life I have not experienced complete victory in. There are areas I have, and those areas are wonderful. And they're completely blotted out to the point I never even think of them anymore. That's what God means by completely blotting out something from under heaven. And He can do that to, for you. But it needs to be complete. Let's go back to Exodus chapter 17, verses 15 and 16. And Moses built an altar and called its name Jehovah Nisi. For he said, because the Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. 
Can the word of the Lord be any truer than that? Whenever Amalek shows up, I promise you the Lord will be there to help you. His word says so. That verse 16 says that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. The Lord will have it. We need to be over here doing what God wants us to do. and We need to be in the fight, but we need to be over here lifting our hands to heaven and asking God for help. Because we cannot beat the natural without the supernatural. Cannot do it. You've got to be, have the supernatural to take care of the evil behind the natural issue that you're fighting. If you do not take care of the core problem of your issue, it will be there forever. Jehovah Nisi, our banner, our banner, excuse me. When we hold our banner up, we say we are going to operate underneath this banner. This is, this is, this is what I'm going to operate in. Last week I talked about a little bit about God's standard. Well, this banner over here in, in, in this scripture is, is the staff of God, is the, is the banner. And, and this is God's standard. This is what we operate under. If, we, if we're lifting up God's staff, if we're lifting this thing up to heaven, we are saying that we are operating under the standard of God. That means that we are operating and doing what we need to do by the Word of God. That we are in prayer, that we're in communication with God, and that we are in fellowship with one another to help hold our hands up when, it get hit, when things get rough and arms get heavy. So it kind of raises a question. Uh, what is our banner? What is our banner? Banners are kind of fun, aren't they? If you... Uh, if you ever go to a, uh, I like the OU basketball game, I, I love football more, but if you go to the basketball game, you're inside, you know, and you get to see the banners hanging around the stadium, you know, and and especially, now, if you go to an OU game, Roy, and you're an OSU game, this this isn't going to work for you near as much as it will some other. Um, <laughs> just that, you know, if you're inside OU Stadium, and, and you're you're looking at these banners, you're like, man, this is my team. This is, this is who I'm rooting for, you know? And, of course, it shows all the times we ever beat the Cowboys. No, not really. Hey, I, I wanna, I wanna, I'm a Cowboy fan, too. I'm a Cowboy fan, too, but I like to harass people a lot more. And, um, but anyway, we, you know, we hold those banners up, and that's, that's who we root for. This is our team, you know? Um, um, but we've got, and I, I wish that we had a couple of flags up here. You know, I wish that we had... I had an American flag up here and, 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 and wish that we had the Christian flag up here. And I think that we need to work on getting that. Um, because it says this is, this is what we stand for. This is who we operate under. Uh, this is what we're proud of. You know, I want to hold up the banner of, of Christ and, and be proud of and, and be able to say this is the standard by which I live. Banners are awesome deal and they've, they've been in play for long time. A long time, you know, when people go to war, especially, you know, back in the Civil War days, when, when they went into battle, the very first thing that they did was they marched that flag out front and said, this is who we operate under. This is who we are. The banners are pretty cool. Let's turn to Numbers. Let's go to Numbers, chapter 21. Oh, my goodness, where is that? Numbers, chapter 21. Well, what banner are we operating under? Numbers 21, verses 4 through 9. And uh, again, the Israelites had been complaining. And that's kind of where we're at now. And, and uh, the Lord takes care of some things here. And he says, Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and, uh, and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. Well, that's a shame. 
So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that, we take, uh, that he take away the serpent from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole, and so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. So God sent these serpents, and when they bit an Israelite, he says, just look to this banner, and when you look to it, you'll be healed. You will not die. Now, when we start to talk about and ask, what is our banner today? Our banner is the cross. You know what? We've been fighting God since the beginning of time. We've been bitten. We're dying. Our lives are full of sin, full of venom. And what do we do? God says, all you have to do is look to my son, Jesus Christ. And this cross that we have back here represents what he did upon it. One of my favorite things to say is that this cross is very, very significant right here because it doesn't show Christ hanging on it anymore. Because He lives. <laughs> and so we take this cross, we take this emblem, we take this banner and we lift it up. And we say that this is the standard by which we live. If you're not living underneath that standard, just like the people in the wilderness, you know, if, you, if you're dying, and, and if you don't have Christ, you're dying. You are full of sin. And you, 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 there's only one way to live, and that's to accept Jesus Christ. That's to look to that cross and live. This is the banner that God's given us. John 3, 14, 15 says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. Many of us have probably memorized John three sixteen, and we don't very often look at the two verses prior to that. But he says, And as Moses lifted up that fiery serpent in the desert, as he's lifted it up, so also, whoever believes uh, in the Son of Man will have eternal life. And then again in John 12, 31, 33, it says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. This he said, signifying what death he would die. Jesus said it. He says, I'll be lifted up. I'll be your banner. He says, I'm going to be lifted up on this cross. This, this is an amazing thing. You know, last week with Jehovah Jireh, you know, with uh, uh, Abraham and Isaac and, and, and the, the sacrifice that was happening on that, on that mount, and just a few hundred feet away or a few hundred yards away right there on another mount, was the same mount that Jesus Christ was crucified on. And that mount sat up so that everybody can see it. It sat up on this hill. And, you know, Jesus, this big cross was lifted up and Jesus was hanging on it. And it was, it was just right there that everybody can see it. And we watched the Savior of the world take on sin for all of us, all of our sin. Remember, we also talked about that God didn't. God knows how we feel, but He couldn't feel how we feel until that point, as Jesus took on 
the sin of the world. But He's taken your sin. He's done that. He's raised up on that cross. He took that sin from you. And then He died. He died the death that we all should die. He was buried. And then He rose again so that He can go on to heaven and send the Comforter to us. Now, this is a significant thing. Now that we have the Spirit of God living in us, if you believe, when we raise that banner up, it's like the perfect connection. The perfect connection. So what banner are you operating under today? If you're a Christian, are you holding that cross up? Are you operating underneath God's standard? If you're not real sure about Jesus Christ, I just want to tell you that you need to be under that banner. Things are going to come in your life that you cannot control in your natural ability. Just because you're a non-Christian doesn't mean that the issues in your life don't have evil tied to them. And you cannot fight that evil on your own. You need Jesus Christ. Without Jesus Christ, that evil that's running that issue in your life will always be there, and the, that Amorite will always be in your life. So as we end and we get ready to sing this song, think about what banner that you're operating under this morning. Think about it. And if it doesn't resemble the cross, maybe it should. Maybe it should. Let's stand up.